Welcome to the Inspire to Invest podcast, where we're sharing stories from real estate investors and how investing has changed their lives. This episode of the Inspire to Invest podcast has been brought to you by Vantage Point Financial. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Inspire to Invest. I have Khadija Jafferji here with me today, and she's a real estate investor from Toronto. And with her husband, Jose, they lead a small group of investors with a Canadian portfolio around $50 million. So it's pretty sizable and significant. And more recently, they've also developed into the United States, specifically with apartments and short-term rentals. And at the moment, she's really passionate and focused on improving the lives of others with financial education and overseeing and utilizing real estate for their financial freedom goals. So she has a company with her husband called Savvy Real Estate Group, where she oversees property operations, financing, management, and construction. And with her personal project management skills, she makes sure that all the work is done on time and within budget, which is like music to the ears of, I think, any investor. (laughs) So thank you so much for your time today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. So obviously it sounds like you and your husband have done a lot. I I don't know in how much time, but maybe you can take me back to the beginning and what life looked like before real estate came into the picture. Yeah. You know, it's funny. My husband and I have been investing in real estate since we met. So we even what my husband was kind of dabbling in it um, when we got engaged. And so ever since then, it was kind of a part of our life, which is kind of nice. You know, we kind of grew together over the years, but um, you know, we started while we were working, like most people, we were working, we were doing investing on the side, we tried various strategies in different markets, you know, buy and hold flipping. I think that when we first started, we were uh, focused on low priced markets, which a lot of people are just because of affordability. We were young. Um, I was like 23 years old when I got married. So we, we you know, we didn't have money. We were just yeah. starting our corporate careers. Um And then, you know, slowly over time, like it's obviously a long story. Um, We've been investing, I think, for almost 15 years now um, and, you know, evolved our strategies, evolved markets, um, so many different things. Um, And then I think in around 2015, um, 2014, 2015, uh, Jose went full time. In 2016, our first child was born. And then after that, um, I went full time, too. So now we are both um, full time in the business and we've figured out ways to create you know, income within the real estate business. Cause for all those who invest, you know, that investing in real estate is not necessarily equivalent to having income from real estate. Yeah. Um, they're kind of different things. Oftentimes um, people invest for, you know, wealth generation and, you know, some other, you know, factors, including preservation of their money and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But um, we had to figure out ways to also generate active income within the business if we were going to leave our corporate yeah. careers. So now, can that's you kind talk of how about, it's evolved. Um just where you started. So you talked about some of those cheaper markets. So can you talk about kind of where that portfolio started and then now like where you're focused on and where you've pivoted to in the last like year or two? For sure. Um, We actually started in Windsor, um, Ontario, Um, again, because we were buying properties at really, really low prices. We were buying foreclosures um, and we were hooked up with some wholesalers out there who were giving us, uh, you know, duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes at really, really low prices. I know Windsor, Ontario has gentrified a lot today yeah. and people are back in Windsor. But um, at that time, like in early, I'd say 2008 to 2010 is when we were there and it was yeah. not very good. Um, so we had a lot of issues with bad tenants and um, we also had issues because it was far for us. Yeah. So Windsor is far from, you know, where we lived. And so yeah. it's drivable, investor, but it's not like something you want to do in a day. <laughs> for sure. And so we had like, we had an, a contractor who uh, said he was doing the work, said he was doing the work. And when we, you know, we kept paying him installments, I think it was like yeah. twelve or $15,000 yeah. in money that we had handed over. And when we finally ended up getting out there like three or four weeks later, um, nothing was done. Now, would you say that you've embedded in part of your process, like having gone through an experience like that, like where they have to send you like video routinely or pictures. Like I know things have come a long way with smartphones. Yeah. So just because you do have a portfolio that now goes even into the States, have you kind yeah. of embedded that in your process just to make sure like people aren't pull it over your eyes. For sure. And I mean, I think that that kind of brings me back to the end of that question, which was that we shut that portfolio down and we brought our portfolio closer to home. So we started, um, Jose joined rain back in the day, uh, real estate investment network. And we started looking at more economic fundamentals, um, and proximity and management close to home. So we started right. investing in Hamilton. Hamilton is still where the chunk of our portfolio is. And then we invested in Oshawa, east of uh, Toronto. Yep. Um, and now we are also in Brantford, Cambridge, um, you know, some other markets just in and around the GTA. And what it did was allowed us to bring 
our team on board and have a boots on the ground team. So yes, like photos and all of that stuff is really, really important, but also just having, you know, enough representation boots on the ground, especially when you're dealing with larger projects was something yeah. that as a new investor, we just thought was non-negotiable. Like yeah. we just, as you progress now, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, we can do things um, farther away from home because we have systems, like you said. But yeah. back then, we didn't even know what systems were, right? We were yeah. just kind of flying by the, flying seat, of pants. By the seat of our pants. <laughs> yeah. So then where did investing in the States really come into the picture? I know that that's attractive to a lot of people right now because obviously the property values in some places are not what they are here, but it also comes with other things like legal complexities and your tax structure and stuff like that. So maybe you can talk about what encouraged you to start investing there and then what you've done to make sure that you are set up properly from like a legal and taxation standpoint. Yeah. So I'll be honest with you, Jose handles all of the legal and tax stuff related to our portfolio there, but we yeah. do have a, a great accountant and a lawyer, a cross-border accountant and a lawyer who has guided us through all of that process. Yeah. Um, really. And honestly, I'll be 100% honest, that has been refined many times from when we started. So we initially had like a sort of a structural chart of, you know, how the US corporations were set up and how they fed into the Canadian business. Yeah. Um, and that has been refined as we have kind of decided what we're doing out there. So initially, um, Jose does some syndications there. So that's where it started. Um, he yeah. is a co-GP on a couple deals there. And um, that was where it was initially set up for. And then I'd say about a year ago, I decided I wanted to buy some short-term rentals. And um, those are sort of owned solely within our own personal structure. So that kind of changed things a little bit. So we set that up. Um, and the reason, you know, we did it was, it just makes more sense. I mean, I think for so long, we've been stuck on this idea that we have to invest here because it's close to home. And we do have a business here. We have staff yeah. here. We have so much infrastructure that supports that, but there's been a lot of things that just don't seem to make sense right now. And yeah. there's only so much you can push a circle into a cube. Yeah. Now, can you talk you know? about that? So for someone that is looking to start, yeah. you know, what would you say are some of those challenges that you have faced in the Canadian market that are more appealing in the States and, and just kind of figuring out those aspects? Yeah. I mean, I guess for me, uh, so like our portfolio in Canada, we have apartment buildings and we have a long-term rental properties. Yeah. Um, we are self-capitalized in Canada. So our entire portfolio is owned within our own corporate structure. And the yeah. reason we did that was for this, you got to ask yourself what you're doing and why you're doing it. So we yeah. did that primarily because we wanted to create wealth for our family. Yeah. So, so I will be saying like anything that you have within that, you guys it's your own money and your own investments. You don't necessarily have partners or we don't have any partners in like you mentioned. Yeah. So in Canada, we don't have any partners. It was our own portfolio. We bought it and we grew it to create sort of a nest egg and wealth for our family um, yeah. moving forward. And that has been really instrumental in giving us a lot of peace of mind. Like we have those assets, but I'll be honest with you. Like by the time you go through the burrs and you do all of this stuff and mm -hmm. with the challenges with our system here, those assets are not necessarily providing us the cash flow that we thought they would. They're mm -hmm. just not. Yeah. With the repairs and maintenance, they're old. All of these markets are repairs, very old. maintenance, too. rent control, LTB. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. So anybody who's like, oh yeah, you know, like, you know, X number of millions of dollars is the cash flow of this massive portfolio. Okay, but yeah. like how much is it actually profiting us in terms of net, you know, cash flow at the end yeah. of the month yeah. or in the end of the year? And, and the answer was, was not good. Um, so we always were doing a lot of flipping and we had other sources of active income. Jose was a realtor for a while and, you know, we had all these things happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we started thinking, okay, like maybe we want to incorporate more investments that are going to actually generate cash flow into yeah. the strat into the portfolio. Yeah. And that is kind of where the long, you know, the short-term rentals came in. And I'll be honest, they're two very different strategies. Short-term rentals are extremely hands-on. Yeah. Um, long-term rentals are hands-on too. We have our own property management company within our company. So we manage that too, yeah. but it is a different type of management. It's yeah. obviously different. So um, I think that somebody looking into the U S I think the U S the numbers generally make more sense, no matter how you, you look at it. Like if and, you're going into the right market, did you focus on for the States? What, sorry, which state? markets are you focused on? Um, so with our, with our, uh, with Jose syndications, they're primarily in Georgia in the Atlanta right. area. Um, but myself, um, I have short-term rentals in the North Carolina mountains. Okay. Um, and then I also have some in the Florida area. So in the, uh, Tampa Bay, uh, region. 
Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I know um, I connected with another investor that he's from Florida as well, but he's actually done the best in the Smoky Mountains. <laughs> so he's got all these log cabins. And I think when he bought, there were maybe 600,000, they've more than doubled in value. And he showed, he actually shared on social just last week, his net operating income. It was like over a million dollars in cash flow just yeah. from the properties that he's got there. And I was yeah. like, yeah. So yeah. I mean, I can good. share I like timing it when he got in, it was the right time. And just the way the equity has grown that he's been able to, to scale that way. So yeah, it's really interesting just to see where people are, are going and what the numbers actually look like. So yeah, it's amazing. Like we don't buy anything that's below 20% cash on cash return. Yeah. Um, and we're putting 30% down Yeah. and we are getting DSCR loans in the U S where they don't ask you for anything. Like I have not had to submit. So, so what is that exactly for someone that like, I don't know what that is. So can you explain that a little bit? So it's just like a, a loan that would be based on the property itself. So okay. it's based on the property, the appraised value of the property and the net operating income of the property. Okay. itself. So they're looking at that for short, because I understood like in Canada, usually it's only if it's commercial that they'll look at it that way. Right. So yeah. that's obviously been the driver towards multifamily and yep. maybe why it's not advantageous for you know, you can't scale as well if it's anything less than five units, but for you're sure. saying in the States that they'll look at a short-term rental and do kind of the same thing that we'd be seeing for commercial. Essentially. And I mean, it's even like, I can get close. We close in 30 days over there. Yeah. So literally from the time you buy the property to the time you submit like your first set of closing docs and everything to, or yeah. your so purchase and sale docs yeah. to the time you close, like literally they have not asked me. The only thing they ask for is a bank statement to show that you have funds and that they're liquid for a certain number of days that would go towards your down payment. Yeah. And when and we do put 30% down, down, down because we're foreign nationals. Is it 30% down? Because we're foreign nationals. Yeah. Yes. We put 30% okay. down. Okay. So, um, so makes... and, and I mean, the rates are maybe a little bit higher than what you would pay on a conventional loan over there. But as long as the numbers make sense, I mean, yeah. It doesn't seem to matter to us. Yeah. Now, are you comfortable sharing what the price point is on some of those vacation rentals? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, the ones that I buy in uh, the North Carolina mountains, they're really, um, they're kind of, I, I focus on a certain type of property. So I'm looking at um, honeymoon cabins. They're usually two bedroom, two baths, um, 600 to 800 square feet. Um, I'm buying, I'm buying them under 500. So okay. between 375 and 500. Okay. Um, depending on the condition, like I bought one, the first one I bought was a brand new build. Um, it was in the mid four hundreds. Yeah. Um, I bought one that was an a frame that was just fully gutted and renovated, but I bought it just sub 400. Mm -hmm. Um, and these properties are expected to do between a hundred and $150,000 in revenues. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And then for Florida, what areas have you focused on there? Um, so we're in the Tampa Bay area. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the Clearwater, um, Seminole, Largo kind of yeah. uh, pocket. Um, and we buy a specific type of property. We like to sleep more heads there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, typically a property that can sleep at least 15 people, 12 to 15 people. Okay. Yeah, so um, that's significant. <laughs> yeah, so they're, 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 they're usually four, four bedroom plus with three to three bedrooms there. Um, you know, they don't do very well. In my opinion, um, it has to be a larger crowd to get to yeah. those numbers. Florida has the issue of having higher taxes and higher insurance. Yeah. So that is something that you have to factor in, even though like purchase price is one thing, but like we talked about, you know, your net revenues are okay, really so important carrying too. costs and stuff like that, that vary from place to place. So when you look at your portfolio and everything that you've done, what would you say you're most proud of? Um, you know, it's, uh, just, you know, surviving it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's been, it's been tough. It's, there's been lots of hard times and, um, just the type of person you become once you go through it is, is yeah. really, I just look at myself now versus the person I was 15 years ago. And I don't think I could recognize myself from then <laughs> to now. Yeah. So lots of learnings. What would you say is one of the biggest obstacles that you faced? Um, you know, I am a perfectionist. I take things really personally. So, you know, especially, um, you know, when things don't go right, like, you know, like we talked about these contractors and it continues even today. Um, you know, I, I lose sleep. I, I, I can't sort of seem yeah. to, to make peace with it and, and move on very quickly. And I mean, I know that's not quite an obstacle, but, uh, those are daily obstacles that we yeah. face. Yeah, no, I can understand that. Now I think with all the experience that you've had in the last 15 years, knowing what you know now, would you say that there's any hard lessons that you've faced that having the knowledge you have now, if you could go back and do anything differently, you would do different? I mean, I think I would have hired faster. 
Um, I, at the beginning of our uh, portfolio growth, we were very focused on um, income generation and like, how much is the, how much is this profitable? I think that, you know, in order to grow quickly and to, to have uh, better systems, you need to hire quickly. And yeah. I mean, if I could go back, I would have started hiring much quicker. I think yeah. we could have actually accelerated our growth. You mean even more for like, from a property management standpoint? Yeah. From an everything, you know, even just an executive assistant, a bookkeeper, which I have now, um, mm -hmm. you know, I have, I, we have staff who work for us now and I think yeah. um, they have been so instrumental in our growth, right? It's, uh, you know, like who, not how, right? So um, figuring out who is going to be those those key players who are going to actually accelerate that growth within yeah. the company. Well, I think when you're starting out, it's like you said, like you have no money really. Yeah. <laughs> or like in this case, the money you have is going towards your business. So you have to make all those decisions. Like, well, if I'm going to spend a $500 a month on a bookkeeper. Like, you know, you've got to weigh out your time versus what they're going to do. And for, you know, I had my own business for 18 years and I think I've shared on past podcasts, but that was one of the biggest things a mentor had said to me because I was wasting so much time. Like, yes, I wasn't spending the money, but it could take me anywhere from a few hours to a couple of days because we were paying like hundreds of people. So like, I'm not a bookkeeper by trade. So like, I don't know all the tips and tricks to make it go faster. And really the system we needed was trying to figure out how to communicate all these part-time transient people working event to event and like how to to roll that through. And then once we did that, like between that and some digital marketing, but our sales doubled that year. So yeah. it just go to show like when you're focused on the things that matter, but again, when you're starting out, it's that balance piece, right? Like if you have no money, it's kind of hard to justify spending the money on certain things. Right. So I think you have yeah. to get some momentum behind you before you make those decisions, but I, I totally sure. get where you're coming from. Um, so we're just going to take a really brief break from a word from our sponsors and we'll be right sure. back. Megan Becker, wealth coach and real estate investor from Victoria, BC. I've spent a decade helping business owners and real estate investors safeguard and supercharge their wealth. Today, I wanna to share some golden nuggets for real estate investors. Tip one, diversify. In this ever-changing market, having a mix of assets is key. Tip two, leverage the power of infinite banking. It's not just a tool, it's a game changer. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just diving into the real estate, let's connect. Visit vantagepointfinancial.ca or follow us on Instagram at Megan Bedker. Inspired to Invest is proud to support the Beyond Success program. In today's complex world, it's absolutely crucial for our youth to learn how to take charge of their financial future. We believe that every young person deserves access to accurate, practical financial information. Designed to bridge the gap, the Beyond Success program leverages a comprehensive educational bootcamp to equip young minds with essential financial literacy skills. At Beyond Success, it's not just about teaching financial literacy, it's also about fostering a foundation for a prosperous and empowered future. Join us. Together we can build a brighter financial future for the next generations. Join us. Together we can build a brighter financial future for the next generations. Thanks again for following along with this episode of Inspired to Invest. In addition to real estate, investing, and running my own brand experience agency for 18 years, I also published a book called The Accidental Entrepreneur in October of 2021. This is my story, and it chronicles how I turned tragedy into triumph to embrace my destiny in entrepreneurship. If you're interested in picking up a copy, you can find the link at serenahomesrealtor.com, and you can also find my link tree with all of the retailers in the details below. Thanks again for your support. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Inspired to Invest podcast. I have Khadija Jafferji here with me today, and she's talking about how her and her husband, Jose, have started and scaled their portfolio, not only in Canada, but also now across the United States with apartment syndications and short-term rentals. So we talked about some of the challenges that you faced as well as your successes before the break. And I guess what I really wanna know is what would you say is the craziest thing that you've experienced as a real estate investor? Oh my gosh, the craziest things have to do with the tenant stories. And I could I could go on and on. Like how much um, time do we have? <laughs> I know, right? I mean, it's just wild. Like I have a tenant right now who um is basically running like a I guess like I don't know, like a like a brothel or like oh, a dear. ring in <laughs> oh. the apartment. There is like 10 people who come men who come in and out all day long. Like oh, it is gosh. crazy. And I learned so much. Down on that. <laughs> like... There's nothing. It's so frustrating. I have learned so much about the legal system and our police system. You're and like, you can't do just anything. <laughs> how helpless things can be sometimes. Um, and just like how crazy the law is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't mean to like you, know, I, you have to hate on it really begs the system, question, but... like when you look at Ontario and some other places, like how did it get like 
it is so crazy. And yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the, the tenants are definitely the most challenging part of this business. And but some of the most entertaining stories that we we laugh about it in our morning meetings and stuff. Just it's yeah. you got to just keep laughing. Yeah. Never a dull moment <laughs> uh, so in terms of things like mentorship and uh, learning. What would you say some of the best advice that you've been given? And have you done anything in terms of educating yourself by joining like masterminds or communities and things like that to help accelerate your learning? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And I, actually my husband says this and I've learned this so much from him is that, you know, if you need to find somebody who's 10 times smarter than you and you will, you know, crush your, your learning curve like drastically. And that has always been our philosophy. Um, even when I started short-term rentals, the first thing I did was join a mastermind. I mean, it cost yeah. me a lot. It was a US based mastermind and yeah. literally within joining the mastermind within like three weeks, I was connected with agents who were th like through the networks of the mastermind, other students yeah. within the mastermind. And I had already started looking at properties. I mean, there was no way that I would have known what markets to focus on. Yeah. I was connected with brokers and agents. So yes, join a mastermind. I cannot, I, all the self-learning in the world is amazing. And we yeah. do some of that too, listening to podcasts, reading books, but the value of connecting with other people who have done what you want to do is just invaluable in my opinion. And yeah. don't, you got to pay people for their time. Yeah. Pay people pay for them and pay for yourself because when yeah. you've paid for something, not only are they accountable to you, but you are accountable. I think there's just something about paying for something that makes it like solid in your mind that you got to get this shit done. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, I can agree completely. It's like they say, when you have an event, even if you're only going to charge like $5 or $10, if people have spent money on it, there's so much more invested than if you're like, it's free. And if yeah. you have a free event, like half the people may not show up, but if you just charge them an incremental amount, then you'll have like, most of them will show up. Right. So For I think sure. it's just the way that people kind of perceive things. Uh, now, obviously you guys have built this robust portfolio. Would you say that you've reached your financial freedom number or do you feel like you're still kind of on track towards it? Yeah. I mean, yes, we are financially free. Um, I just, I think it depends you know, life changes. We have three kids now, your goals change and you're constantly evolving. Uh, we have aging parents now. So those financial freedom numbers always change, but for us, it's, it's not about that anymore. I think it's, you know, it's about challenging yourself and becoming better. I mean, if yeah. we stopped, we would feel very empty. Um, and, and, and granted the markets change too, right? Like we are not necessarily always making the same income, um, because of the markets. I mean, real estate is volatile, right? Sometimes as much yeah. as it's not, it is, especially when you're on the active side of things, you know, like, you know, realtors, mortgage agents, people who are doing more active work, yeah. um, things change, right? So you got to constantly be, you know, evolving and, 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 and getting better. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're, we definitely have goals to grow our portfolio still. I think yeah. we have a number that we'd like to be at in terms of our net worth. And um, I think for that, for us, that's the big thing. The big focus is our net worth goals. Yeah. Um, and of course, continue to grow income because like I said, things are constantly changing. Yeah, no, I understand that completely. Now, what would you say um, in terms of how real estate has changed your life? Like, what do you think life would look like if you hadn't gone down this path? Oh my goodness. I think we'd be working corporate jobs um, or maybe we would be in business. Like before we started uh, real estate full-time, we actually had a few businesses. Jose and I, we had a like a boutique tea shop that we owned, like a retail store. Um, we always had this entrepreneurial bug. Like we always yeah. wanted to do something. So we could be in a very different industry. Like we could have been operating retail stores or doing yeah. something different, but I certainly see the impact real estate has had on our family too. Like all of our family, Jose's siblings, my siblings, my yeah. parents have all invested in real estate and, you yeah. know, my parents were able to retire like at 59 or 60 yeah. um, because of the investments that we kind of coerced them into make a little yeah, bit, but yeah. they are so thankful they did it. Now they have their own portfolio. So I am just so thankful. It's not just about you. It's, it's it, like, although we are self-capitalized and we don't, our portfolio here didn't, we weren't raising a lot of money. We started mm -hmm. raising money when we went into the U S yeah. um, but we've also felt like we've been able to sort of inspire other people around us to do yeah. it. And that has meant so much to us. Like it is, be, we're beyond thankful for it. And I think that's the thing. Like when you are doing something, I think that it's natural that you want to be able to share that with other people, right? Like, I think that's part of what makes it so fulfilling. Uh, sure. Now, obviously the name of this podcast is Inspired to Invest. So I always like to ask people if there's a particular quote that motivates or inspires them. 
Yeah. I mean, there's so many, right? It's got like a quote list. Um, my favorite quote is how you do anything is how you do everything. We live by that principle. Like we put our heart and soul into everything we do, yeah. um, how we treat our tenants, how we set up a new short-term rental. Like it's, yeah. it's just how you live your life is in your business, in your personal life. And my other favorite quote is, um, a Helen Keller quote, which is, um, you know, the one that, uh, oh my gosh, my brain, um, most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even heard, but must be felt with a heart. And yeah. I think that again, like we are heart people, our staff have all been with us for so many years. Our tenants have all been with us for so many years. Um, so, you know, building businesses, yes, like I get it, it's cutthroat and all of that, but like, really we need to come back to some of those roots and like the fact that why are we doing what we do? And it's to yeah. inspire other people to help other people, whether it's other investors or our tenants or the guests that come through our short-term rentals, like, you know, everything you do, I think there has to be some heart in it. Yeah, no, I love that. Now, is there anything in particular you want to leave with someone that could be tuning in, listening or watching? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, real estate has changed our life. I think it can still change everyone's life. I know that sometimes in this market, things are kind of dim and grim and, you know, people are feeling a little bit like they're stuck. And I think that it's, you're not stuck. There's so many things you can do. And I think yeah. that you don't have to build, you know, a $10 million or a $50 million or even a whatever portfolio. You can even yeah. have one property. The, the power that one or two properties can have on changing yeah. your life or even investing passively in a few, you know, ventures that just involve small things. Yeah. Um, I think that compounded over time, those things can really make a huge difference. So yeah. I would urge anybody, like no matter how big or small, like I've been in the same shoes where I've seen people who are like in it and already established and you're like, uh, who, how do, like, how do I even do yeah. this, right? Yeah. Yeah. But no, I think I that, you know, that. just small things over time make big difference. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now for anyone that wants to learn more about the kinds of projects that you have on the go or future investments, what's the best way for them to reach you? Uh, yeah. So we have our website, um, which is savvyrealestate.ca. And um, you can uh, check me out on Instagram, my first name, last name. And we actually have a podcast too. We haven't been recording in a little while. We've been taking a break, but um, we have some great episodes with some amazing guests. I think we have about 50 or 60 episodes from the last year or two. Um, nice. So it's uh, the Savvy Real Estate Investor Show. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time for being here for today. Of course, for anyone else that's tuned in as well, thank you for your time. And if you have enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. And you've also followed along on social at Inspired to Invest podcast. And remember, when you invest in yourself, the sky's the limit. Thanks again. Thank you to Vantage Point Financial for bringing you this episode of Inspired to Invest. The views represented on this podcast are for general information only and does not constitute investment or other professional advice or an offering of securities. The host and guests featured on Inspired to Invest make no representations as to the performance of any particular investment. Should you decide to make an investment, you are responsible for conducting your own review and analysis. It is recommended that you obtain independent legal accounting and tax advice from licensed professionals.